my name is David Snipes, and I welcome you to our 2022 Western North Carolina Winter Leadership Training Series. For those of you that uh, watched last night uh, or yesterday, our bishop, he got us kicked off, and tonight is the first night of several nights of leadership training. So we thank you so much for carving out time in your schedule to be a part of this. If you, uh, just to make sure that you are in the right chat room, this is Strategizing Local Church Stewardship and Finance in a Pandemic, Post-Pandemic World or Church. So I am blessed this evening to be joined by Reverend Dr. Mark King, who is the Western North Carolina Conference Treasurer. He and I will be splitting up the content for uh, our workshop this evening. But I want to tell you, we are so excited that so many of you signed on this evening. This afternoon, uh, Mark and I spoke, and although we had strategized about what this evening would look like last week, when only 32 of you had signed up, um, we decided today that we, we would shift a little bit and we hope, and, and we're, we're kind of um, taking it on faith that you had the opportunity to review the PowerPoints that were sent out to you last week by Dr. King. So, because we're not going to go through the PowerPoints one by one and dive into them very deeply for the sake of time, as well as the number of people that are going to be on the Zoom call. But let me say to you, as was noted in the Zoom etiquette slide, if there are questions that come up, Mark and I will be monitoring the chat room and we will try to get the information to you through the chat room. If we don't have the information available to answer your question, please know that we will follow up with you and you are more than welcome to follow up with us following tonight's session, as we believe it is of great importance that you all get the information that you need and that you came to receive. So um, Mark, is there anything that you wanna say before I pray us into this meeting and, and we begin our session? Uh, well, like David, I, I thank you all for joining and registering and uh, welcome tonight. We hope this will be beneficial to you. In the chat, I have posted our two preview presentations. Uh, I hope that you're able to see those and, and download, open those, keep those for yourself. Um, if for some reason you're still having trouble, just reach out to me with your email and uh, I will try to email them to you directly. But anyway, welcome everyone and I look forward to being with you tonight. Thank you, Mark. And if now, if you will bow with me. Gracious God, as we come to you this evening, we are mindful that it's been a busy day for many of us, that you have called us to this place at this time with these people to learn about finance and money and ministry in your church. So God, we pray that you will help us to set aside whatever busyness we may have experienced earlier or whatever distractions that are on our mind for the day ahead and help us to not only open our eyes and our ears, but open our hearts to your transformation so that we can walk away from our time together being a more faithful disciple and leader in your church. We offer this prayer in your son's most gracious and holy name. Amen. Amen. So folks, tonight we're going to talk about stewardship and finance in the local church uh, in, in a post-pandemic world. And as I shared with you, you received two different PowerPoints, which kind of gave you an overview. And I'm going to kind of bounce over my particular one, because as I shared with Mark earlier today, the stuff that he has to share with you 
is stuff that you need to do your job. Now, I'm not saying that you don't need to do or be aware of stewardship and or generosity uh, related to finances of the church, but there are some specific things that Mark will talk to you about that I think um, will, will certainly be helpful for you moving forward in your leadership role in the church. So I'm gonna share the screen and kind of flip through the slideshow very quickly but what I'm going to ask you to do is if you have a question that you will put it in the chat room. And then when I get finished with my part and before Mark starts, uh, we, we can take a few questions, but certainly we'll get back with you. One of the things that we have learned through the years is that the word stewardship certainly brings about certain things in one's mind. And often when we hear the word stewardship, and if you were to ask people in your church, how do you define that or what comes to your mind, you would hear a lot of different responses. So as stewardship and finance leaders in your churches, we would challenge you to ask that question of yourself as well as challenge your church members to think about what stewardship is. If we were meeting in person, I would probably have you answer this question in a smaller group around the table. And often people will say, well, stewardship is about raising money. Um, so one of the things that we would really challenge you to do this evening is to, if that is the position that you have and your church membership has, then you would rethink that position because stewardship and being generous is so much more. It is not a fundraising activity. And because of the apportionment dollars that we pay, unfortunately, sometimes it's viewed as dues paid in exchange for religious services. And that is just not the case at all. Rather, stewardship is recognition that all that we have and all that we have been given is a gift from God and that we are to care for that because God has entrusted us with all of these gifts. So those are the two main points that we would want you to understand as a stewardship leader, but also hopefully explain that and help your congregation come to a better understanding as well. So we talk about generosity as a spiritual practice in all that we're saying right now, and annual giving is a part of that. So we want to encourage anything that we do from uh, the standpoint of, of promoting good stewardship or generosity is tithing, the biblical tithe, and offering it as the backbone of our local church finance ministry. So we want to encourage people to make their annual gifts from their income. And there are biblical reasons for this. If you look at the ones that are on the screen, some of them you may be familiar with, Malachi 3.10, bring to the storehouse uh, all what you reap from the crop, Matthew 6.21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, uh, Luke 12, to whom much is given, much is required. Uh, John 6, 1 through 13, this is a parable of the loaves and fishes. And then of course, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, uh, God loves a cheerful giver. Mm -hmm. There are other scriptural references for me and that I've actually preached on before, and there are probably scriptural references that you relate uh, to money and finance and stewardship and generosity. So I would encourage you to think about that and, and study. And I always encourage people to think about the texts that are not what you would call the traditional stewardship texts. So hey David, David, you're yes. not advancing. Your, no, the slides are not advancing. Okay, you don't see why give spiritual reasons because it's advancing on mine. No, we don't. Okay, so I may have a problem here. I apologize. Um, let me try sharing again and see if I can get us where we need to be. Yeah, and maybe maybe try not putting it in presentation mode. Sometimes that works. 
Okay, now what? you're where you want to be. Yeah, that works. So you see why give spiritual reasons? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so what we do with our money uh, reveals who and what we love and prioritize. That's something that, that needs to be communicated with your church folks. Uh, God asks for us wholeheartedly and, and, and to not hold anything back. We commit our full selves in not only our hearts and our minds, but also even our pocketbooks. And things, people, and causes we love will rearrange our household budgets. In other words, we always encourage folks to prioritize and look at what I call their check register or go to their banking app and say, where is my money going? And if I am proclaiming to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then is my money going where uh, it, it dictates that, that, that people would look at that and say, well, this guy is a follower of Jesus Christ. Did it advance? Do you see why yes. give? Yeah, yeah, it did. Okay, great. So you know that we have a history uh, uh, with stewardship and generosity. Uh, related to John Wesley, who said, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. I encourage you to integrate that into your generosity and stewardship teaching, that it all needs to be a, a, as an act of worship. And it, that's all based on the fact that we understand that God is generous and we are created in God's image. So if, if that's what we want to be, if that's our role model, then get this information and this message out to the folks in your, in your pews. So what do we give? Time, talent, and treasure. Sometimes people balance it out and say, well, I teach Sunday school. I work with the youth. I sing in the choir. Uh, I, I do all these things. I don't have to give as much. But we encourage to, to focus on no you can't get by with not giving of your financial blessings just because you give in other ways. And of course, we want to emphasize that the tithe or 10% of the income is the standard of Christian generosity. So statistically, if you were to look at that, you would find that the in um, mainline Protestant denominations, that when you look at how much church folks are giving, it's usually between the three and 4% range. So one of the things that we would challenge all givers to the church to do is to challenge themselves to increase by 1% per year. It's a journey and we all have to start somewhere. So uh, going from 3% to 10% can be a major, major financial burden for families that have made other financial commitments. So walk that journey with them and challenge them by giving 1% uh, as they move forward. Um, and as I said at the bottom of the last slide, speak pastoral words about this. Don't make people feel guilty because they're not giving at the level that they should, but walk that journey with them and speak a pastoral word for those that are struggling and, and trying to do better. Um, where to give. When you're looking at your uh, giving as a local church, local uh, church budget always comes first because that is the foundation of the ministry that you are conducting. So that is the first priority that we try to make emphasis uh, to our church membership, even beyond some of the community giving that, that your church membership may be a part of as well. So one of the things, especially during this pandemic and as we hopefully move toward a post-pandemic world is giving electronically. Uh, when we first started teaching this particular workshop or some variation of it, we didn't even talk about giving electronically. But if, if, if you have not considered this, and I don't care if you are a small church 
out in the middle of the country, or if you are a church representing a church that's in the middle of town, uh, please consider the, the use of receiving funds electronically because it increases statistically. We see that when you do that, it, it increases the income to the church. It helps people grow in their discipleship. Um, there is an opportunity to use the Western North Carolina Conference portal. Mark King, uh, thanks to his wisdom and vision on that, helped set that up at the beginning of the pandemic. And he can tell you that a huge amount of money has come in through that portal that basically the conference, or not basically, the conference has functioned as a pass-through to the local church. But one of the things about when you give electronically is we want to make sure that we discourage folks from using credit cards because as a part of a larger uh, generosity as a steward, as a spiritual practice, you don't want individuals to go into debt unnecessarily. So um, if, if they're going to give electronically, have it come straight out of their checking savings account, use a debit card if, if a card's involved. So those are things that you would want to emphasize. So the next section is about encouraging a generous church. When we get called out as a foundation staff to many of the churches that are struggling financially, we find that that church does not have a current mission statement. So you say, but David, the United Methodist Church's mission is simple, make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Yes, that is correct. However, every church, based on their demographics, based on where they're located, based on what the gifts and graces of the individuals in the church might be, they carry out that mission differently. So please take time to look at the mission of your congregation. If, if it needs to be dusted off and fine-tuned, take the time to do that with your leadership and then make sure it is communicated so that people know what they're a part of and how you as a faith community carry that out. And of course, as you do so, you can't say thank you enough to the folks that are giving and that are a part of that process because the reality is money follows the mission. And of course, our leaders set the tone for that. Uh, you, how you talk about it, your willingness to talk about it, sharing your own experience, uh, give examples from your own experience, and you will find, and, and once again, statistically, this is information that's been proven. When you do this, people give more financially, they're more committed, they participate more. It, it's just all encompassing. And that would be the goal that, that we would have. So one of the things that we want to do, it used to, we taught that you focused on an annual stewardship campaign. And I'm not saying that you don't do an annual stewardship campaign, but we're going to suggest that you offer stewardship and generosity teaching throughout the year. So that would mean that if you're a pastor or if you're a lay person, encourage your pastor to actually preach about stewardship and generosity throughout the year, to offer ongoing uh, stewardship classes. I have an example here of Saving Grace, which is one that, that is a United, right. one of the newer United Methodist programs. So uh, be intentional about it. And uh, you can actually move away from the four weeks in October or the last two weeks of October and November, believe it or not. Think outside the box, especially uh, during the pandemic, we've had to look at different ways of doing things. So this, this is all about developing a year-round generosity culture. Um, and one of the things that I would really encourage from this particular slide is getting volunteers to share their testimony about it. Often the pastor will preach about stewardship and people will sit in the pew and say, well, he or she is doing that because that's how their salary is paid. But if you find somebody sitting in the pew 
who will stand up and share about their journey, their discipleship journey related to generosity, you can find that it can be quite transforming. Um, the question that we often get these days when we're talking about encouraging generosity in the church is, do you still believe in, in the pledge or, or the estimate of giving, which we, we how you say things matters. And um, you, we learned several years ago not to talk about a pledge. It sounded too secular. So we talk about estimate of giving. It doesn't feel like uh, people uh, are as threatened by that language. Really, what I would say to you is you need to take the pulse of the culture of your foundation and determine if pledging or, or supplying an estimate of giving is what you need to do. But always remember that when you do participate in that practice, it's, it's also about accountability uh, of that spiritual discipline of generosity on behalf of the person making the pledge. And that is something that is of great importance, of course, in our discipleship journey. So now finally, uh, let's talk about, finally for my section, uh, then we'll move to, to Dr. King, church as a faithful steward. So Mark, th this will lead straight into some of his information, but if you're going to encourage generosity and faithful stewardship, then as a leader and as an organization, as a church, you have to be accountable for that. And when the folks give, they have to trust that the powers that be, the leaders, the financial leaders, are using the money and investing it and, and doing those things that hold them accountable with full transparency and um, and helping to grow those funds in the best way they can. So there are just a few basic things. Uh, certainly use checking and savings account for highly liquid funds as, as you're paying monthly bills and payroll and things like that. But then if you have uh, investments like an endowment or someone has left a bequest to the church, then you can put those in longer term funds and, and they can help you fund ministry for years to come if invested and structured in the correct ways. And of course, the foundation is, is here to, to help you do that. Now, Mark will talk to you more about the responsible use of debt and, and defining debt. So I will let him uh, talk more about that later, but you, you do need to make certain when you're being a, a faithful steward, if the church does need to take on debt, make sure you're being a good steward by shopping the rates and the terms and, and making those commitments in, in ways that will be beneficial to the ministry of the church. So uh, I referenced this a minute ago about long-term investments. If you go to the foundation's website and you look under resources, uh, you can find a sample endowment document. Um, that would be what we would call funding ministry in the future, whereas your operating budget funds the current ministry that's taking place. So uh, please consider that. And once again, know that it's all a part of the church being a faithful steward. And part of that as well is to encourage gift planning. I just referenced um, the possibility or the example of if a church member left a bequest to the church. Um, there are some things that donors, church members can do that can reduce their tax liability, that can secure a lifetime income for them, that can preserve assets for their loved ones and heirs, um, and all at the same time, being a faithful steward and making a difference in ministry beyond their lifetime. So it's, it's kind of exciting stuff, even though people don't often like to talk about end of life issues. Uh, some of the other uh, gift planning options that at least uh, the foundation can help you with, if you have a church member that has some appreciated stock and they want to give it to the church, 
just reach out to the foundation and we can handle that stock transfer and distribution for you. We also have donor advice funds where a church member can establish the fund, put money and or appreciated stock into the fund and then advise us to send the distribution out to the church, whether that be your operating budget or some special project you might have. There are also these things called charitable trust that can be very appealing to folks that also uh, uh, provide lifetime income, some tax benefits as well, but also provide for the church. And then in addition to church endowments, individuals can have endowments that would benefit the ministry at your church. So a lot of different opportunities uh, for the church to be faithful stewards. So um, I'm going to stop there. And I hope that Mark has looked at the chat room because I was not looking at it as I was going through the slides. But I will look at them and respond to your questions. But let me just stop there and see if anybody has observations, comments, questions. Mark, I know that was a lot in a very short period of time. But any comments or questions? Uh, David, I don't see any any uh, questions. Uh, Lord Beth gave an amen to the electronic giving, um, <clears throat> but we'll just pause for a moment. If there are any questions you want to put in the chat, David can answer about this subject. Mark, I do want to, I saw where you put in there, and I think this is such an impressive number, over $400,000 over the last two years has come through the conference portal and has gone back out into your churches here in the Western North Carolina Conference. Almost half, I like to round up, almost half a million dollars um, ha has come through. So that, that is an impressive number. We do have a question, David. Um... Can a church have an account through the endowment and people add to it? Yes, you can. There are two different types of endowments. The church can create a church endowment that is a, a developed and approved by the church governing body, uh, being church council. And, and um, I say that because some people use different terminology for the, the church governing body. Um, and once that's established, donors can give to the endowment and it is considered a charitable contribution. Um, also, individuals can establish endowments. <clears throat> and even if you're not the, the originator of that endowment, it still is considered a, a charitable contribution if someone would like to give to it. Any other questions for David? All right. Well, thank you, David. And I'm going to shift now. You're going to... Uh... Got a question. Oh, okay. What's the question? Okay. This is uh, Melbourne Prayer for Homesville United Methodist. And I just um, got into this position. And learning, it's a learning process for me. Um, will I be able to get a hand copy of of what we talk about tonight through uh, David and yourself. Yeah, Melvin, if you will uh, email us, um, we'll put our emails in the, in the chat when we get done. Are you able to see the chat? Yeah, well, no, I'm not able to see the chat, but I, have, I think I have your email address. Yeah, just see, email us and we'll be glad to mail that. Man. And that goes to anybody. If you had trouble opening it up, I'll put it in the chat link. Uh, if you have trouble with our two PowerPoints, please email us. We'll be glad to send it out to you directly. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, yes, sure. All right, so uh, we're going to shift now. And what I'd like to do, I, I got uh, something twofold tonight. We know that tonight's emphasis were on uh, new treasurers and new finance leaders and stewardship leaders in your churches. Uh, we want to be sensitive to that because you're a different audience than the one for tomorrow night that we're calling veterans or uh, the more experienced ones returning back to their roles. So in that environment, I just wanna say no question is irrelevant. No question is not smart. Every question is real. You're coming into this work. 
And God bless you for taking it on. I am hearing stories all across our churches now where so many uh, churches are suffering trying to find financial leadership nowadays. Uh, Longtime treasurers are retiring or uh, deceasing, and uh, they got folks coming in and brand new. Uh, please know we don't expect you to be out there all by yourself and learning things. So um, this is what tonight's environment is about. Uh, I do want to put a plug in. Uh, one of the things that David and I do uh, is the certificate program in church treasury. We're going to be offering that again this year. Uh, it is a virtual four Saturdays. Now, this, this is different than tonight. We're going to get you out tonight by, by 8.30. Um, but these are four Saturdays, two in March, two in April, where we'll devote 20 hours of training to be a treasurer. And we'll cover all kinds of things. And we have some excellent resources and speakers coming in. Uh, it's a minimal $25 registration fee for you to do it. We will open registration up February the 1st. You can find it in e-news, or you can email me a day, and we'll be glad to send you the link. Uh, but we welcome you to come do this. When you get done, you will get a certificate suitable for framing uh, that you can hang in your wherever in your home that says you are a certified treasurer uh, and, 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 and be proud of that. But more importantly, you will get a valued education and what it means to be a treasurer. Uh, so I wanted to, to put that plug out to those of you who are coming in and new this year. I got two things to do tonight. One is I'm going to cover the PowerPoint that I have sent out. It is brand new for me. I put it together uh, this month, and it covers everything I possibly could think of that a treasurer needs to know, a treasurer needs to do, a financial secretary needs to know, a finance committee needs to know, and put it there so it's always a resource, because I, I can't come to your living room uh, as much as you may need the resource. Uh, so this is taking place of that. What I want to do for a little bit of time tonight <clears throat> is to look at the various topics that are in mind, and I'm calling it Finance 101, that are in mind to, to just do some highlights of some very important things you need to know, uh, allow time for questions on any of these. And then as we, we, we get all that done, everybody feels comfortable, or at least you know, the questions are, 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 are ceasing. I wanna shift us over to the real piece of our presentation tonight, strategizing finance and stewardship in a post-pandemic world. And I'm praying for a post like never before. I'm tired of this pandemic, I'm ready for it to be done, and I am ready to live in this post world. But if you heard Bishop Carter last night, and I completely agree with what he's saying. The post-pandemic world is going to be very different than the pre-pandemic world is. And I've been trying to stay on top of trends and, and, and things that are happening in a way to help you and your local churches. And, and some of this I'd like to share tonight is out-of-the-box thinking. But I, I think it may give you some resources that we need to go forward in our church. So for right now, let's look at uh, Finance 101. Everybody see it? So in my presentation, these are the topics that I cover. Now, I'm not going to go through every slide. I just want to just stop for a minute in, in each one of these topics and really pull out the things that are very, very important. And please, along the way, stop me with questions or put questions in the chat. And David, I ask that you monitor. But the role of treasurer and financial secretary, and this really does go back to the book of discipline. It's also just solid financial prudence, but these two roles should be different. Now, I will tell you that the, uh, the treasurer in the Book of Discipline assumes the position of expending the funds of the church, and the financial secretary is assumed in the discipline to be the recorder or the receiver of funds in the church. Uh, but your church may do it differently. Your financial secretary may be the one who writes the checks and has somebody sign them, and your treasurer is the one that counts the money and, and is involved in taking it to the bank and all. That doesn't matter. They just have to be two different people. You do not want the same person doing both of these roles. 
And the reason is, it's not about trust. We'll get to this in segregation of duties too. It's not about trust, it's about protection. You want to protect your people so that no one would ever have an opportunity to make an accusation or, God forbid, be tempted because they're the one person who does it all. Uh, too many times these lax roles in the church open to temptation and good, faithful, loving people get caught up in the world and financial struggles and financial needs of their family. And here's this easy pot to just kind of take and nobody else will know. And when embezzlement or anything like even accusations surface in the life of a church, it will be years for that church to recover. So why take that chance? Why not that, you know, well, we're a small church. We can't even get somebody to do one of these roles. You want to get us to listen. Whatever you have to do, if it, it may be, you may have to pay somebody to do some of this, but it's far more important to, to, to keep these duties separate than run the rest of the gamut because you may be sacrificing a few dollars now to separate the two, or a little bit more time to find these people versus something happening in the life of your church that will take years to recover and really hit hard. So keep these dudes. The other thing is they can't be a member of the same immediate family. Now, I know down here in the South, we're all related to each other somehow, way, way back. But in, in, in the disciplinary language, uh, the segregation of duties means immediate family. Who's that? Well, that's, uh, you're thinking of the individual, that's the spouse, children, um, siblings, parents, and, and probably to a degree in-laws uh, should be considered. Now, two cousins twice removed and all that language, it's probably separation. Now, it's really mainly focused on living in the same household or close to the same household. So that, you know, when they dip into the teal, so to speak, they may know, but nobody else outside the household knows. So that's, that's, that's where the discipline comes in for segregation of duties. Uh, this also is important when it comes to counting funds. Never let one person at any time in the life of your church be alone with cash. And I'm talking from the offering plate to the bank. It's just too easy. When you're carrying an offering plate full of cash to the place they're going to count and you are alone, nobody will know if you didn't pick up a 20 or a 10 or something put it in your pocket. So just for fiduciary and responsible purposes, try to have more than one, never have personal law, two people not related helping with the counting duties. Uh, <clears throat> is there a question in the chat I see? Mark, there was a question about asking what about the financial chairperson? Uh, chair and I'm, I'm thinking it's about whether they can be related if you've got this treasurer and financial secretary as well so you know if if the, the chair of the finance committee all they do is preside over the meetings organize the meetings but don't really make decisions by themselves um a distant relationship may not hurt but I would err on the side of caution and even the finance chair would not be a related person just for um, you know, no hint of impropriety. It just keeps everything sacred and separated and, and balanced if you do. Um, <clears throat> the best way to handle some of the segregation of duties is for your church to have a set of financial policies. And I have a set that I'm, is on my website. I'm glad to share with you. Email me. I'll be glad to. You can also go to my website. I have a ton of resources on it. It's the same thing as the conference website, but you put a backslash at the end of org and treasure, and that'll take you to my page. And you'll see this PowerPoint on there tomorrow, by the way. Uh, but it, it'll, it, it has some of the financial policies and it segregates just what a financial uh, secretary does, a treasurer does, and the chair of finance or the finance committee does. The finance committee, in, in a nutshell, is responsible for setting up and overseeing the financial system of a local church. Um, 
Sometimes they have to do the workforce duties, but uh, primarily their role is oversight. It's treasurer and the financial secretary that does a lot of the work in the church on these roles. So if you're in one of these two roles, uh, it's good to look at these policies. I put in the PowerPoint what are the duties, some of the roles of these uh, uh, responsibilities, and I hope they'll help you. So I'm gonna jump to joy payroll if, if, if we can do that real quick. Um, I label this in the PowerPoint, the joy of payroll church style. And I have said it so many times before, and I'll say it to you all who are brand new tonight. Clergy are the most complicated tax payer in the United States Internal Revenue Code. And, and it comes down to just two things. And if you don't get anything else out of tonight, get this. In our system, United Methodists, but even more so with the IRS, Clergy are considered employees of the salary paying unit. And in our system, for the most part, that clergy is being paid by the local church. So even though they're appointed by the conference, appointed by the bishop and cabinet, they are an employee for income tax purposes. They are an employee of the salary paying unit. Now, wait a minute, Mark, I've heard uh, clergy are self-employed. Okay, let me talk about that. That's the other side of it. They are only self-employed for social security purposes, social security taxes. Now, why? I think it goes all the way back to the, the New Deal in the 1930s when Social Security Act was coming out. Uh, the only employee church it had for the most part then was the pastor. And because of separation of church and state, uh, the bill was construed not to impact churches to pay the employer's share of Social Security. Um, and that's changed because now lay staff, non-clergy staff, are employees of the church for Social Security. But clergy still are not. It's in the code that way. So the only thing they're self-employed for is their Social Security. They have to pay the self-employment rent. Uh, <clears throat> So you don't do anything with Social Security for clergy. You don't withhold it. You don't match it. Uh, they're responsible for that. But they are employees for income tax, which means they get a W-2, not a 1099. And I've, I've helped and talked to so many churches about this particular role. And it is in the IRS rules. That clergy, I mean, they, they, you know, they don't say truck drivers and cooks and physicians and all that, but they do say in the code, clergy receive a W-2. Uh, <clears throat> now, churches are not required to withhold any tax, income tax otherwise, for clergy. You're not required to. Clergy, for the most part, pay estimated tax. And that includes the part they would pay for their income tax as well as their social security tax. That's on them. However, the IRS does allow if the clergy and the church want to have a voluntary relationship where they can do voluntary tax withholding, you can do that. And that means every time you pay your clergy person, uh, just like everybody else may be on your payroll, you withhold whatever tax they tell you and you send it in on their behalf to the government. Now, don't use the tables for clergy. You'll mess up every time if you use those tables because you got that self-employment thing that you can't do, but clergy are still responsible for. So what I always say is the clergy person needs to give the dollar amount, not percentage, but dollar amount they won't withheld from their pay. And that's what you send in every payroll. And then on the W-2, in box two, which says federal withholding, you put the whole shebang. Now, a stupid clergy person will know how much tax they need to pay for both income and social security. And they will give you that dollar amount to cover the whole thing. And you'll withhold it and report it in box two. And when they do their tax return every April, they do their 1040, that's where all of this stuff gets reconciled. 
and what they have withheld is match up against with what they owe of Social Security income tax, and you hope that there's a fine line of balance that they don't either owe much or they get a refund back. Uh, that's the primary thing I want to say about payroll. Now, when it comes to your non-clergy staff, they're treated just like any business. You're required to withhold income tax. You're required to do Social Security. Withholding from them, you're all matching. And you report it on W-2 just like you would everybody else. I see a couple of questions up. Let me pause for just a moment and see what they say about that. Mark, some of them have been uh, open to everyone. You may have some direct, but I did put the link to the Book of Discipline uh, online and you address the okay. others that came to me directly. Okay, good, 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 yeah. Mark, yes. I have a question. I have a, I have a question. Um, as far as Medicare, do we have to fill out a form by the end of this month to send um, what was taken out from Medicare or report that? Uh, you, you know, let, let me ask you a little bit. What do you mean by the end of this month? Well, um, like I said, I'm new in this position. Sure. And i am heard that there's, there's something, I already filed the taxes and everything, but there's another form need to be sent to the federal government about Medicare. Is that, does that exist? I don't know for sure. I, mean, I, I think I know what you're saying. Yeah, I think I know what you're saying. So here, I, I think what you're talking about is W-2s. Uh, interestingly enough, when you do your employee W-2s, they have to get to the employee by January 31st. Right. Now, when you send it to the government, you actually send your W-2s, a copy of all of them, and then there's a W-3, which is kind of like your summary. Right. You send that to the Social Security Administration of all places. You don't send that one to the IRS. Okay, and you have system. until the end of February to do it. So a lot of times what you do is you'll give the W-2 to their employees. And if there's a mistake or an error, you got that 30 days or 28 days in February to get it corrected so that you don't have to file another one, a revised one with that Social Security. So that's why they give you that extra time. But that's the only, that's the main thing to get out in January, the W-2s. And then, of course, I'll talk in a minute about 1099s, but you'll need to get those out. Those are what I think you're referring to. Okay, so w, the W-3, which I'm talking about, I need to send to Social Security. Of, of right. their w at the end of February, by the end of February is when they're due. Which I send their W-2 to, to them? Yeah, you send copies of all your employee W-2s, including your okay. clergy, and a W-3, which if you get your W-2 packed at an office supply store or use an online service, the W-3 will be included with it. Okay. Uh, that's okay. Not talk to you more. Thank you very much. And let me just say too, you also send the state copy of your W-2s to the Department of Revenue in North Carolina by the end of February. They get a copy of the W-2s as well. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay then. Let's see. Can janitor landscape and company owners be paid through a 1099? All right, a good question, Chad. Let me let's talk about 1099. Let's just back up a minute and talk about contract employees. Um, churches like 1099s because you don't have to match Social Security. It's one form, you fill it out, you put it in there. By the way, starting last year, you no longer use a 1099 miscellaneous. If you have contract people in your church you are issuing a 1099 to, you use a 1099 NEC, non employee compensation form. It's unique now and it only records for those contractors. You only need to worry about a 1099 for a contractor if you pay them $600 or more in a calendar year. So if you pay them $599, they still have to report it but you don't have to give them a 1099. Here's the rule, and, and I have on my website a, a checklist you can use to distinguish between a contractor and employee. And I'm gonna tell you the IRS uh, <clears throat> for a while was getting really heavy on this. Uh, they do not consider people who uh, in the music world of the church to be contractors. And the test is, 
they, 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 they come to the church at a certain time required by the church, whether it's rehearsal or for the services. A lot of times they're using equipment and music that the church has purchased. And those are all things that are not allowed for a contractor. Those are employees. Now, if you have a janitorial service or a landscaping service where as long as they get their work done by Sunday, they bring their own equipment, their own supplies, they do it all, those are contractors. But if you require them to do the yard or the church cleaning on Friday afternoons, you provide the tractor, you provide the gas, you provide the cleaning material, you provide the vacuum, all they do is coming in and doing that work, chances are the IRS would see them as an employee. And therefore you need to do social security matching in a W-2. I do recommend a payroll service. Um, I think it's so much easier when uh, you have that and they can, they know the laws, they take responsibility for the payment of taxes. Um, I, I just think it's, it's, and I've got two great sources to recommend if you want to reach out to me via email. Uh, one of my sources will take care of um, your, not only getting your taxes to the IRS, but they will also pay Westpath, your uh, United Methodist Personal um, Investment, P I UNPIP, whatever that stands for, UNPIP contributions, your 403B contribution directly to Westpath the day of payroll. And that's real-time investing for those of your staff who are in the UNPIP program. So that's, that's email me back, and I'll be glad to do that to you. Well, David put it up there. I was going to have to, we use paychecks. I was going to try and be a little uh, more um, silent yeah, about that. We're not, we're, we're not getting paid by either one of them, but it's in a matter of full disclosure. I was, in full disclosure, I will tell you the conference uses paychecks. And a foundation uses ADP. Pension and benefits. Um, word about that is that uh, for the clergy, the conference will bill you for the church's part of their pension and the church's part of their health insurance. Now, there are some pieces that the clergy have to pay, and we can either bill the clergy, or if they do payroll deduction for these events, we will bill the church, and the church just sends us the money, with the exception of one thing. The UMPIP uh, that I just mentioned, the personal contributions to their retirement at Westpath, Westpath will bill you for that. The conference will not. And Westpath only knows what to bill if the form is submitted most updated with the amount the clergy person wants contributed. So be sure every January, if they change their UIPIP amount, uh, that you fill out that form. Again, on my website, it's on the benefits uh, website at the conference. Uh, you can go to westpath.org and download it. It's the personal contribution form. You fill it out, send it to Westpath. Don't send it to us. Send it to Westpath, and Westpath will be glad to uh, start mm -hmm. billing you monthly for your, um, for your benefits. Um, we take the billing straight from the clergy comp form. And guess what, folks? Those are not always done the most accurate or the most late of, of, of things happening. So there's sometimes some errors uh, that clergy comp form is designed to where it will tell you what the amounts are going to be billed. So please look it over. If you don't have access to it, talk to your pastor <clears throat> or call your district office, whatever district you're in. They can get you access so that you see what the form would say and the amounts that you're going to be billed for for the year. Uh, <clears throat> any question on pensions? I know I'm moving awfully fast, but I promise you, if you look at the PowerPoints, it'll have much greater detail. Mark, what yeah. about uh, a question, personal pension part need to be done each year or only when you change the amount? Only when you change, only when you want to make a change. So if you're rolling over 21 into 22 with the same amount withhold, you don't have to do anything, Westpath will continue billing you for that. Okay, so uh, year-end reports. We are in the process of doing that now. 
And urine reports and apportionments are very closely tied together. I hope everyone has noticed this year, Bishop Carter and I have discussed the cause of the pandemic to greatly reduce the number of questions that we're asking this year. Uh, not to say that the other questions in the years past are not important, they are. They give tremendous information, but let's face it, folks, most churches probably have not done the work that those questions have asked for in the last year. So we really cut it back. And the things that we, we have to have really um, in terms of apportionments is table, yeah. table one has membership, baptisms, demographic information, ethnic questions. Those are important. And we need that for accountability. But it's table two of those questions that enter into the apportionment calculation. And every year, somebody, uh, some, I get calls from churches that saying we made a mistake on our year end report and it hit our apportionments and they went up. So now is the time before you submit to review that report. And for those of you who are brand new and you've never seen this report before, uh, just compare it to last year's, because in the, in the system where you put the information, last year's is listed. And if something seems odd, number one, you're gonna get a warning. The system automatically alerts you. It's kind of like a Star Trek, red alert, red alert. Um, but it also lets you look, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't look right. And also the conference will fill in into that year in report, the apportionments that were uh, calculated that were paid, special offerings paid, advanced offerings paid, and the pension and health benefits paid by the church to the clergy person. And then there's some other questions. So this, this is what we use to calculate the apportionments for every church. It's an average of certain expenses on table three of the last three years. We don't just go to one year. We try to look at all three years. And folks, I know I get called, and I don't mind calling. I, uh, in fact, you can vent to me about your apportionment. I'll listen. But you need to understand the rules for setting the apportionments was decided by the annual conference in session. And the calculation formula is decided by the annual conference in session. And the budget that's put into the calculations is decided by the annual conference in session. And I can't go back and change any of those personally. Now, I can make some you know, adjustments here and there based on your reporting, but the system itself, um, I can't do. So I just really, really strongly urge you to be very careful about your in report, triple check it before you submit it. Do we have some questions on that? Workers' compensation. Um, uh, workers' compensation, okay, well, let me just say about that. That, that is an insurance. Uh, you purchase workers' compensation through your uh, liability and property company, whoever you get your insurance for your buildings. North Carolina does not require it unless you have three employees or more. And these are part-time, full-time, that doesn't matter. You got three employees, you're required to have it. If your pastor is the only employee you are not required to have it, but let me tell you this, it is not uh, expensive insurance. It really isn't. It's tied to uh, formulas for wages. If your pastor gets hurt, say they're in a car wreck on the way to visit someone in the hospital, that's the worker's comp claim. And if they're injured and they're out, even if it's not severely, worker's comp insurance will come in and help not only the, the pastor with their, their needs or medical needs, but will also help with some public supply and things like that. So workers' comps are good insurance to have. So Methodist pension plan to define benefit. I'm not talking about the pastor contributes. Yeah, so it's two, it is. And, and in the PowerPoint really does explain that out. We do have a hybrid benefit plan right now. Define benefit. Defined contribution. Defined benefit of those old timey pension plans where you work for a company for so long and they guarantee you a payment when you retire uh, that you didn't have to put in. It's, it's just pension. And we still have that. 
And it is uh, one amount for every church for every full-time pastor. Now, if you have a three-quarter time or half-time pastor, the, the amount shifts accordingly. But um, it is the same amount across all the churches, no matter what you pay. By the way, the cost for the conference for that from Westpath is about $5,500 per full-time clergy. But because the Board of Pensions has such good management, and thank David and the foundation for helping us with that, we only build the churches 3,093. The other 2,500 or so is, is picked up from by our investment. So please know that the conference is helping with that. Then we also have the defined contribution. And this is based on the pastor's compensation. So if you will get 2%, regardless of what you put in, if you don't put anything in, but if you will have put in at least 1% of your compensation, then you go from 2 to 3% that the conference will build the church for and send to West Bath. So we, we do have both of those. Um, <clears throat> pastors are going to get benefit of both if they don't put a dime in. But I'm telling you, today is not the day not to contribute to your pension. And the sooner you start, the younger you start, the more it's going to grow. I cannot believe it. I started putting mine in when I was 21 years old. And I can't believe how much money I got in it right now. And it's not because I've been good and I've been putting money in. It is the power of investment and the power of the markets. Um, so please, I, I just really encourage everybody to do that. Taxes. Uh, very quickly, uh, you are exempt from paying income tax on your earnings by virtue of coming under the United Methodist Church's 501c3 certification. Now, that means you don't pay tax on your revenue. But that doesn't mean you don't pay tax. I've already said, on non-clergy employees, you still pay payroll tax, your share of it. Um, you don't pay unemployment tax for federal or state. You certainly pay property tax on a property that is used for the benefit of religious or, 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 or sacred duties. Now, if you got a piece of land that you're, you bought years ago and you don't do anything with it, it's just sitting over there, your county may come in and say, that's not being used for exempt purposes. You're just owning that. They may come in and charge you property tax and you can appeal it, but just understand you may end up having to pay some property tax on that. So there are some taxes you have to pay, uh, but for the most part, you don't have to pay tax on your, on your, your net income. Audits. The Book of Discipline requires an audit every year. But now let me back up. It does not say engage a CPA firm to do it. You can do an in-house audit. There are audit guidelines on my webpage on, my, on the Treasury Services that will tell you everything you need to do to perform an audit. Um, this, is come, this comes from the General Council on Finance in Nashville. They put together a marvelous product that just lays out all kinds of checklists and things you need to do to do this audit. Now, who does it? Well, it needs to be a minimum of two, probably no more than five. And they can't all be finance committee members. You need to get some non-biased people, maybe from the membership of your church. This is not, they don't do anything else. But once a year, they come in and help with the audit. You look at your bank statements. You look at your payroll records. You really don't look at giving records um, because those need to be kept confidential. But you could ask your financial secretary to, um, you go to them, don't have them select. You go to them and say, okay, here are 10 members that we know of. Send them a card that says, and then the financial secretary in privacy lists the amount that the church says they, they gave. Nobody else sees that. Sends it to these people. There's a card they will return back to the audit committee that says, yes, I agree, this is what I gave. They don't put the dollar amount, they're just agreeing to what was on the paper the financial secretary sent. Or they say, no, this is not, I gave more. And then you got a red flag to look into a little bit. So that's, that's one thing you can do. With that. But anyway, the audits will, the, the guidelines and checklists will help you with that. 
Got a couple questions. Would a church need to pay income tax if they're renting the parsonage is not being used by clergy? Well, they have other properties rented out. They pop up. Now, if it, uh, that's a great question, Nancy. A couple things on that. Number one, if that property has debt to it, in other words, there's a mortgage tied to it, but you're renting it out to a non-church related party, you would need to pay what's called unrelated business income tax. Uh, talk to me offline sometime and I'll go into more detail about what that involves. Um, you may have to pay property tax if it's being used by a non-related church party renting out whatever property you have. Uh, Mecklenburg, you may have to pay in, uh, property tax on that. Uh, it all depends on the county and, and, and what the assessor may say. Is there some requirement to spend 5% of a given foundation book for I know that you pay it? No, I'm not aware of any. David, I don't know if you are. Um, what, what this goes back to is, is um, a spending policy of your investments so that some of it is being liquidated every year, but it doesn't touch the principal. Uh, but I'm not aware of any taxing under because of the 501c3 also covers investment earnings. It also, as long as it's in the name of the church and, and the, the church has control over it. Mark, that question must have come to you directly. I don't see it, but um, okay, yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. And then uh, apply for refund for sales tax. You know, the other tax churches have to pay are sales taxes. Some states will allow a church to get an exemption and they just show that to merchants and they don't have to pay sales tax. North Carolina, they can do that, but it's like pulling teeth to get one. What North Carolina refers, prefers you to do is to pay the sales tax and then twice a year submit a form for refunding and you can get that back. Um, and that's on the North Carolina, just Google uh, North Carolina sales tax refund nonprofit and they'll, they'll take you straight to the form that you need for that. Mark, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, just for a point of knowledge, you know, not being in this as long, what about cemeteries? Is there, is there a tax on cemeteries, uh, church-owned cemeteries? There should not be. I mean, if it's owned by the church and it's being used for the burial of church members and even to the public at large, but it's primarily uh, controlled by the church and for the use of church members, there should not be any tax associated with that. Okay. And same thing with cemetery funds. If you got them invested, there should not be any tax on their earnings. Okay. I went through a lot of stuff, folks. And again, I apologize. Um, I want to be valued of your time. Uh, this And this is your time. Um, again, make the offer. You get the PowerPoint, look through it, email me your question, call me your question. And, and I'll tell you, if I don't have the answer, I'll tell you if I don't have the answer. I'll go find the answer. I've got a ton of resources that I can look into and, and get for you. So don't hesitate to talk to me offline. But you're not out there doing this by yourself. We're, we're here to help you. On oh, partially rental property tax, it's a matter of no debt. Now, if you don't have any debt on it, that's a good question. Thank you, Kathy. That's a good question. If you don't have any debt on it and you, re, you rent it out, to a non-church-related uh, party, you don't owe tax on that. You can do that. In fact, this is, Kathy, you know, I kind of opened the door for the next part of what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, ways, really the essence of what I want to spend the next few minutes on is ways churches can look at income strategies in a post-pandemic world beyond the offering plate. So are y'all excited? You want to look at this real quick? Are you getting pumped? Uh, some of you look like you are, so I hope you are. <laughs> All right, let's look at that. So here's what we'll talk about next. What have we learned? What have we experienced from the pandemic? Well, 
Statistics are telling us both membership and attendance has declined 50 to 60%. And that, that, that's a hard number to, to get your hands around. It's a sad number. Uh, people have become very used to watching church in their pajamas on Sunday morning. And you can decide to continue that or not once the pandemic is over. But if you decline it, you, do, you decide not to do it, you will continue. These people may not come back to your church in person. COVID has forced new reliance on technology and change. Uh, we left the 1950s a long time ago, but COVID forced us to leave the 2000s. And so there's change today. Amazingly, and even in our conference, we saw that most held their own financially. In fact, some churches did quite well. They had a surplus at the end of 2020 and 2021. That's primarily the result of certain things. Number one, a lot of churches took advantage of the PPP law, the payroll protection program. A lot of churches got help from our connection fund. We gave almost uh, three quarters of a million dollars out to help churches in the payment of their pastors and their, their benefits in, uh, during the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> but they also realized they weren't using their buildings as much. They weren't buying literature as much. They weren't buying music. Uh, the utility costs were down. And so as a result of that, they actually built up some cash. But once we reopen again, we can't count on that. Prioritizing became crucial. We've always stressed this. We've always encouraged churches to prioritize. It was critical at this point. And let's face it, normal, whatever that was, it no longer exists. So what do we see trending? Evangelism is critical for sustainability. Now, Methodists have a hard time with the word evangelism. We, we, we hear street preachers, and we think of the word evangelism knocking on the doors and, and doing what the Jehovah's Witness do. It. And, and so we need to get a better definition of that word. That's, that's, that's some evangelism, but that's not all of it. It's about new people. Um, we don't want to forget the current people. Please don't hear me saying that at all. But there's an opportunity now like never before to reach out in some way that with new people. Now, it can't be the old models, but it's critical for the church to go forward to, to have this uh, as, a reliable, as a priority. Facilities may need to be reconfigured. It needs to be a missional focus. And we said this earlier, digital income, digital giving will become 70% percent of your income. That means online giving. That means people be encouraged to use the bill pay of their own banks, uh, people mailing in their contributions, whatever. It's beyond the Sunday plate. It's, it had gotten up to be about 50-50, but they're now telling us that it's going to be 70 percent. Uh -huh. Mergers and adoptions of churches are going to become more common. We're beginning to see this in the conference where uh, two churches will come together that can't really sustain themselves separately. Or a uh, more stronger church may adopt a struggling church and work together. And you know, Methodists are in a good place for this because we've been doing charges since the days of Wesley, Masbury. Uh, but this may become, again, more common. Remote working. Now, we're not seeing this right now, but trending tells us that within the next five to 10 years, uh, as people who insist on working remotely, they will begin to move out of the cities. And they want to return to the countryside. They want to return to small villages. Uh, they want to raise their families with those options. And so, believe it or not, as the trend has been for the last 100 years, migration to the cities, uh, you're going to send, start seeing a trickling coming out of the cities, and some rural small towns may see resurgence. And you're going to have a core. This is the, the good news of tonight. You're going to have a core that's more committed than ever. Now, they're stressed. <laughs> they're anxious. 
but they love God. They love Jesus Christ. They love their church. And, and they don't want to see it die. So even though evangelism becomes a priority, it's all more important than ever to, to be pastoral to the core. And you know what? I guarantee you, you're among that core. You wouldn't be in this workshop tonight. And I know that you're thinking in your heart, I want to see my church thrive. And finally, structure needs to be simpler. And, and we have resources for this in the conference to help your church with a simpler structure. Uh, still fulfilling what it's required to do, but doing it in a way that um, will help you. And your superintendent can, can help you with those. So here are four truths that um, I think are very important. Relationship in the future is over ritual. People want to still be in a relationship uh, in some form or another. And in this way, our smaller membership churches may have greater opportunity than our large ones. Mission over membership has been around for a long time. Conversation over conversion. People want to feel the freedom to ask questions. They don't want to be told you got to do A, B, and C, and D to get to heaven. They want to talk about what it means to even be a Christian and to have safe places where conversation can happen. And this last one hits me hard as a preacher, a pastor, but trust comes over truth. People would rather trust and even be thinking outside the box in, in relationship with their, their clergy person, with other Christians, than being told, wham, 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 this is what you've got to do uh, in order to be Christian. Now, yeah, there's some universal truths. I'm not going to deny that. But trust to get to the truth is what's going to be a new way to do. So what are some strategies to employ? Very quickly, uh, let's go versus y'all come. Success is going to be need to be redefined. It's not going to be in numbers. It's going to be in relationships and fruit and ministry. Smaller is going to be uh, the most norm. Care for the core, outside the box, thinking on your facilities. Technology is here to stay. New people become the most to reach. Stewardship becomes equally about giving as well as managing. We may see a return to more and more pastors being bivocational or churches themselves creating tent making opportunities. Now, I am convinced that one of the reasons the Holy Spirit was able to do the work of the gospel in the first century was that Paul would go into these cities as a tent maker get established, build relationships, and using the Roman roads that at that point in history were the most accommodating and not any other point in history to be able to travel and to do what he did. Entrepreneurial approach to capital raising. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in just a minute and devising other, other um, sources of income. So here's the out-of-the-box thinking I'd like to propose tonight, and, and it's, it may not be to your church. This may scare you to death. It may scare some of your finance people. This is not the conference saying you have to do this. Not, and I couldn't be furthest from the truth. This is simply possibilities. This is simply raising an idea, something that you might want to think about and explore. And I'm here to tell you, it, it can't be done overnight. You're going to really need to flesh this out and take some time with it. But when income and the shrinking giving dollar is all the more common, the church could participate in 21st century American capitalism. There's no law that prohibits churches from engaging in free enterprise. Now, there's some, some strategies that put in place, some, some laws that uh, uh, make you watch it. For instance, Unrelated business income needs to be 30% or less than your total income. When it starts to be, when your unrelated business income, uh, that's what got Jim Baker in so much trouble, besides the embezzlement, um, uh, started being more than the, the true nature of the entity, the IRS starts looking at that and starts wondering, hey, you're, in, you're a for-profit enterprise. You're not a nonprofit. So that's why these, these uh, minimums are put in place. 
Um, <clears throat> don't automatically assume all income outside of giving is unrelated business income, but just watch it. Be, be prepared for it. Understand that tax is a flat 21% of your net income. This is income after expenses. It's not only the gross income, it's the net income. And I often tell people, you pay 21%, that means 21 cents of the dollar that you, you may use in these unrelated enterprises, but you get to keep 79 cents of the dollar and that's 79 cents you didn't have yesterday. So don't, just because you may have to pay a little tax on it should not frighten you away from it. Your property tax exemption, I talked about that, may be withdrawn. And just understand with any enterprise you look at, insurance, business plan, structure, all that needs to be considered. It is not overnight. It is something that, that really needs some time. Well, I'll take just a few moments to look at some ideas. Child care free school. They call it child care, don't call it daycare. We're not caring for the day, we're caring for children. But these have been used by churches. Now, I wanna start off, let me back up. I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna take this off. Don't use any of these that I'm going to share with you today purely as income we're making. That, that would defeat the point. That's not what the church is about. We don't exist to raise money. We exist to build relationships and bring people to Christ and strengthen our discipleship. And I think you can use all of these as ways to do that. And then the side benefit might be some additional income. So please hear me to say this. It is about the gospel. It is about doing for Christ first and foremost. But child care free school is a wonderful way to impact families in your, in your community. Before and after school care, this is happening more and more. This is one of the reasons people are not going back to work is because they don't have places to care for the children. I know of one church that does a food truck once a month. <clears throat> and, and, you know, number one, make sure it's good food. But they do a food service, a food truck. Um, you know, we used to do Wednesday night suppers and lose money on them all the time. And I never did understand that because if you have good food, they're going to go to a restaurant and purchase it. So why not make your food service event, whatever it might be, Wednesday night, Sunday night, Friday night, um, make it good food and charge a good price for it. People will come and pay it and, and make sure it just doesn't break even. And then in those events, you have ways of ministry. A bakery and woodwork. I'm talking about these two. I know of a church <clears throat> that had uh, was in a neighborhood of some real at-risk teenagers, and they had an individual at church that had a burden. He was really good at woodworking. Now I'm going to say this, and, and and again I apologize. I didn't have anything to do with it, but he wanted the boys to come do the woodworking. So it was very sexist. Um, <clears throat> but he started woodworking in the basement of his church. He bought equipment, he, 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 the, the church uh, provided supplies, and these, he got something, uh, an arrangement worked out with the local high school that the, the boys could get out of school early, come to his woodworking shop. He'd teach them this trade, he'd get them off the streets, and the church turned around and sold the furniture because it was really well-made furniture. So not to let the, the ladies be outdone, and again, it just really bothers me that it's so sexist, but this is the way it was. They started a bakery uh, and, and uh, taught the girls how to cook. And the, they sold baked goods to the community two days a week. And let me tell you, from what I heard, there were lines outside all those days to buy this goods. Now, I think you can teach guys to cook and you can teach girls how to do woodwork. So don't let it be sexist. Classes, music, arts, cooking. I know one church that does a music academy one week a year and charges registrations for it, bring in people that cover that, they make a little money off of it, teaching people the, the things about music. And you know, we Methodists, we know how to cook. We have been cooking forever. Uh, let's teach people our recipes and have a cooking school one week a year, or two weeks a year or something like that. And we talked about rentals. Farming, <clears throat> back in the days, um, Land leases for farming was very common and very popular. And churches that have acres and acres of land could lease out their land for farming. Uh, 
there's a real big, uh, you all know from the farm to the table movement out there right now, that this could be an enterprise. I know of a church in our one of our uh, districts in North Carolina Conference is doing this. They're, they have livestock uh, for years. This is the way the children's home raised its money. In Winston-Salem, it did farming, still has animals, it had animals that they uh, cared for. Your basement, turn it into an exercise or gym. Sports clinics, fundraising suppers, concerts, real estate development, even laundromats. When I have time tonight, and I got a video I'd love to share sometime that shows how you can put a laundromat in, the, in, a, in a church basement that's only used for a few hours a week pre-pandemic and the money they make. And then they turn around and they build relationships with the people who come in and use that laundromat and even give out gift cards to the poor in the community that have no other place to wash their clothes. And this is a need all across our conference. So anyway, these are some ideas. Um, please understand congressional support and unity. Do not split your church over something like this. This needs to be a great unity about it. Failing to plan to plan to fail. Risk tolerance, business plans. Seek out legal counsel, tax professionals. Don't try to do everything on your own just because it looks like a good idea. And very quickly, um, I'm gonna wrap up. A uh, couple examples. This is with uh, Wesley Community Development in our conference. Um, this is one church that developed some of their land. They leased it out to an entity that, um, that built property, rental properties, condos, things like that on the land. And they, they receive income from just the leasing of the land. It, it wasn't a, they, they didn't give it away, they didn't sell it, they're just leasing it. Uh, another one um, uh, is taking a part of their uh, property and going to devote it to retail and uh, lease out space for retail in a very thriving part of their, their community. <clears throat> another church, uh, two churches merged and uh, the old property of one church, they tore down the church and they're going to build condos with a developer and uh, sell these. And this is a, a residual of income coming into the church. Anyway, there's, there's all these. I'm going to stop now. I see there's a few questions. Um, thanks, Chad, for that. Okay, are there any other questions on, on in our chat or anything anybody like that? Again, I just can't say enough. Think outside the box. Participate in, in the economy that is so strong in our country that could benefit you to open your doors more than you ever had before and bring people to Christ in some other way or another. Strengthen people in their relationship with Christ. Uh, all right. I'm going to shut up. Any, any more thoughts? Mark, I just want to add some of the conversation you and I had prior to tonight. Um, our goal, of course, was for you to tune in and to receive information that would be helpful as you do your job um, as a financial leader in your church. Um, this last part, we went back and forth about what, what do we include, what do we not include, but there's, there's one thing that we know for certain based on the pandemic is that we can't do things the way we've always done them. And we know furthermore that we can be successful doing things differently than we've done them before. So what that's going to take is this whole thing that Mark's been talking about uh, with the examples of the most previous slides is think outside the box. Step out boldly, um, looking for new opportunities, looking for new partners. Um, and it, it might seem a little bit strange when you start talking about putting a laundromat in the basement of the church. But um, you know, who would have thought we would be starting the third year of a pandemic um, either? So things change and we have to change with it or, or we won't exist. That's the bottom line. So 
we encourage you to, to go where no one's gone before, but go in faith. Thank you, David. Yeah, I just put this PowerPoint that I just did in the chat. So if you want to download it, it's available for you to do that. Question. Yes, Melvin. Uh, it's a lot to, uh, for me. It's a lot right now. You know, it's overwhelming to learn so much. Uh, you know, being you being initiated in this position, finding the chair. But I wonder, uh, the pastors of the conference, uh, where a lot of the financial stuff that we're talking about tonight and trying to implement them throughout the membership or the congregation or whatever. So, okay, what's I'm the question saying, again? Are the pastors being shared this too? Yes. Well, some, but we do a lot better job than we probably are. Uh, um, we, uh, we got pastors on here. Uh, we got some pastors on here. Uh, yeah, I see Mary John and Chad, and I know others are on here. So slowly but surely we are, and I hope that they are are listening and receive. I know they're receiving, they're listening, receiving some of this. And and um, the richest part that can happen, I think, Melvin, is conversations offline with some of their church leadership about some of these ideas. Yeah, well, I see that. Okay, Good thank question. you. Yes, sir, Rick. Um, do you have any suggestions as to how we might? Uh, encourage the congregation to kind of deviate away a little bit from an awful lot of uh, designated fund giving and give to a general fund? Yeah, that's always, you know, twofold. Number one, number one, I always tell churches when it comes to a donation that goes designated, unless the church has set it up, you're under no obligation to accept that gift. If somebody comes in and wants to start a playground fund and gives money to that, and the church hasn't started to plan a playground, you can say, you know what, thank you, but we're not ready to receive that gift, and it'd be better for you to hold on to it than it to come over onto our books and just sit there. Secondly, um, go through your designateds at least once a year and, and call them. And if you have some, that, like, for instance, there's a children's fund but you didn't spend money from your budget on children's ministry as much and their needs. Spend those designated first and deplete them before you go to your budget. Thirdly, and I did this in one of my churches and I loved it. It's a large church that we did this for. Every budget area had both an income and an expense. And if people want to designate to youth or children or music, it would go into the budget on that income line, but it would help to offset directly the expense. And the deal was that if at the end of the time you had more money in there than you spent, it goes back to the church and to the general budget. It didn't go off to some designated. Now, you have to get your church to vote on that. You have to get your church to agree to do it that way. But you can have income lines in your budget that that hit up against your expense. Now you got to be very very careful because everybody's going to love to give to the children's fund and don't want to pay the light bill or the pastor's salary. So it needs to be budgeted. And once you hit the budget that the, the gift is, then like I said, it goes back into the job. That's another way we've used in the past. But in the end, every church is going to have designated special gifts. It's just as real as having four gospels and, and just manage them and stay on top of them as you can. Mark, I um, earlier put our email addresses in the chat and I realized you're using as well treasurer at wnccumc.org. Yeah. Is that yeah. correct? <clears throat> yeah, if you can't remember my name, uh, just send it to treasurer at uh, the conference website. WNCCOC, I'll still get it. But David, I think we need to respect their time. It's now 8.34. Uh, again, thank you, everybody. I know we throw a lot at you, but we're available offline, phone calls, emails. Um, let us help you. And I hope you came away with at least one or two new ideas to help you in your work tonight. Um, I'm going to close this out in prayer. Gracious God, we do thank you for everyone on this, on this webinar tonight. Lord, bless their work, bless their ministry, bless their sense of calling to do this work. It's challenging. 
It's not easy. But you, you, you don't call us to a life of ease. You call us to a life of service. And best of all, Lord, you don't call us to do it by ourselves. You're with us, and you bring partners along the way. So bless our time together tonight. Bless new ideas. Bless unity in the church to, to even consider them as we give ourselves and all this to you in Christ's holy name. Amen. Y'all have a good night. Thank you.